drone set. Ready to go. All right, welcome back to another live stream learn with me where I'm going through all the material in the advanced R textbook by Hadley Wickham. And last time we had finished chapter three on vectors. Today we're going to be starting chapter four on subsetting. And I'm really excited to talk about this chapter because I, <laughs> this week I actually had a lot of subsetting challenges <laughs> that I needed to navigate in this one of the projects that I'm working on. And so I, I felt like I was <laughs> getting exposed to what were a lot of the common challenges <laughs> in subsetting. So maybe I'll pull on some of those examples as we go through, or you'll certainly see, or I'll, I'll point out some examples of the common sort of cha uh, challenges that come up when you're doing subsetting, or at least that I certainly run into all the time, because at first they're not really that intuitive. Um, well, some of them are, but they could be unintuitive. So. We're going to try to bring in some really cool examples, and I think the book will, as always, bring up some nice examples too. <clears throat> All right, so we can just get right into this then. What even is subsetting, right? Well, subsetting is pulling out some particular length set of options from a set that already exists. So in our cases, a lot of the times when we're working with vectors, you know, it, which is the the coin of the realm in R, we're going to be interested in taking out information from the vectors because we don't want it all all the time. And so that's what we can accomplish with subsetting. So it's naturally one of the foundational tools that everyone who's going to be using the R language needs to have some competency of. <clears throat> cool. So the things, a little overview here of what's going to get talked about, probably not today in the stream, but because this will probably be a two-part series, let's see if I can get that going. Um, but as we go, move forward, we'll probably talk through the six ways to subset, the types of operators that one uses the subset and I think that's probably what we'll get to today something interesting about this chapter is that we're actually gonna see a lot of use cases for subsetting in data analysis so while this is a strictly speaking advanced R is a book about learning some of the more technical aspects of the R programming language there are these subsections where they go over commonly used applications for a given topic. So this will be a really nice one. And in this case, we're going to use a lot of examples from a data analysis. Also, I don't know where I put my mic, or how to put this mic, so I'm not like, <clears throat> not in the way, but also appropriately getting sound. There you go. That's probably better. Okay. Plus I have my, if you can see, I'm always looking over here and that's because the screen that I have showing t to you guys is my second monitor, obviously. Yeah. And I have like my OBS mixer chat set up on this one. I'm not sure if it's the best approach. Maybe it's better if I had it so I was looking at the camera and I had extra stuff over here. But this is sort of what I got going on right now. <laughs> and tuning all this stuff seems like a arduous process. It's just too much. Okay. So we do have this little quiz here that we could try to take. And maybe this was useful for me to do and talk through some of these. So so what's the result of subsetting a vector of positive integers, negative integers, logical, or character vector? Hmm. 
uh, with. So what it's getting at is that of the types, the six ways to subset atomic vectors, um, you're going to get different things based on when you use each of these techniques. Or, sorry, these are different types of atomic vectors, right? And they want to know, well, what are you going to get out from subsetting an atomic, uh, a type of vector? And I believe you get out Oh, no, sorry, I'm reading the question again, so wrong again. Here, we're just asking, if I were to subset a vector, and I used, so it's like what I was applying before, if, and I used these different types of values or data types to do the subsetting, what will I get out? And the case is here, you, if you use positive integers, you'll get out the elements that match the locations for those integer values negative integers you'll get out all the locations that don't match the element locations of those values and you these are this is exclusive so you can't use both of these together for a logical vector you'll get out what is true i believe and then a character vector you'll get out something that matches the string that, that seems more particular, but I'm not sure if this is the case. I think it has to match exactly for vectors. That's something we can expand over. Let's find some stuff. Well, I'm curious if they even have to be numbers, but I'm not sure what this would give out. So if I try to subset stuff on the character vector, it's going to give me an NA. But say this was an A. A B. Okay. Find some stuff here. And then I want an A. I'm still going to get an A. So, See, I still get an NA, so I'm particularly sure how you use a character vector here, unless, oh, right, because I have to be named, right, so if this was A is equal to A, and I did this, and then I searched for A, right, because remind yourself that if we looked at the attributes, and we talked about attributes in the last chapter, this is the metadata attached to a given object, so here, we see that the only metadata attached to this vector is one of the two most common meta attributes that could be attached to an object, and in this case it's names, and we see that we only assigned a name for the first element in our vector. And so if I went on and assigned additional names here, then you go through here and you can see that these names, and then they could be accessed via subsetting as well. See? Cool stuff. Cool, so character vectors can access the names of vectors. So you have to have a named vector in order to use character subsetting. What's the difference between bracket, double bracket, dollar sign, when applied to list? Well, bracket's gonna access the list. Double bracket access the content of the list. And then dollar sign, I believe, is just a shortcut for double bracket. Yeah, and we'll talk more about each of those things. Drop, false, when should you use drop false? When you're trying to retain the dimensionality of a, a data structure so drop when i'm subsetting sometimes 
I'm not sure the particular case is, but sometimes when you're subsetting things, it's going to take away dimensions and remind you that dimensions are the a particular attribute that contains information about the size or <laughs> dimensions of the data structure. And so when you're subsetting and you're subsetting into a different dim dimension size, so a common case here would be like, say, if I had a matrix and I pulled out a vector, oh, the attributes of the vector that I pulled out are now going to be forced to drop the additional dimension. And so you can prevent that sort of behavior from happening from, by using this command drop false as one of the arguments in your subset. And we'll see some of the examples of that. X is a matrix. What does this do? How's it different from this? Well, this name value binding binds X to the value of zero. This binds X with a given structure to zero. And so in this case, we're creating a new relationship. This one, we're using an existing structure that has metadata attached to it. And we're just going to add contents to that. I think that's how that works. And then how can you use a named vector to relabel categorical variables? So it's something like this. But this is a named vector. So this is and also this is technically a named vector. And we know it as stuff as such too, because if I as we learned last time as vector stuff it should give me false, right? Oh. I mean yes. True or not. <laughs> um, I forgot what if you have more oh right right it becomes is vector gives you true no attributes other than names right so if I gave this vector an attribute beyond names then is vector would return false so Does that answer our question? No. So I was stumped on this one. So I'm glad I'm here reviewing the material. So I already spoke about this outline, but we'll talk about just using the standard bracket. We'll expand to using other operators such as the, the double bracket and the dollar sign and talk about principles of simplifying and preserving. Oh, so that's the, those are the terms that were related to that drop content concept I was talking about. Okay, so let's dive in. So you can use the single bracket to select any number of elements from a vector. So let's take a look here. And we did a similar example in our toy playing around with stuff, but this will be nice for illustration purposes, and it's also going to demonstrate each of the six ways that you could subset something. And if we do this, six ways you could subset something. All right. How do we subset? Well, here are the six ways. Positive integers are going to return elements at that specified position, as we stated. So if I had say I wanted to subset this vector which is just a, a atomic vector of numerics or doubles right because they're not integers decimals 
and I want the third one, and I want the first one. Well, as you can see here, this is the third one, this is the first one, simple enough, combining to create the subset, um, combining to create this vector bound by the brackets is going to give us those two values. Additionally, you could also get the values in the order that they are, which is kind of weird to think about, but this is going to come in handy later on when we want to use this sort of behavior for accessing other named objects and using their order to subset of different objects. So in this case, we're just using the same one to demonstrate the principle, but you're going to see that this comes in handy later. Another cool, interesting feature about subsetting is that it's not limited to extracting information that is different. So you can also get duplicates. So in this case, if I wanted two of the ones, then I could just sample one twice. Another interesting feature is that real numbers are truncated to integers. So there's no rounding up is basically what this wants to tell you, where if we looked at, or it is rounding up? No, it's, yeah, not rounding up. So if we looked at the vector up here, and we see that the second element in our vector is 4.2, if I were to use 2.1 or 2.9 here, I'm still going to get out these values. And why this might be useful, mm, I think it's more of a, a caution than utility. One potentially useful way is, like, say, if I wanted to randomly generate a set of numbers that I then use to subset a vector, then, and I sampled those numbers, I don't know why I sampled those numbers in a in such a way, maybe to follow some distribution, but I, I sampled them so that they weren't integers, they were, they could have decimal values. And then I know that using those decimal values, I'm gonna pick out a particular element. So if I were to sample, let's do this. This is gonna be say I wanted like rand I, or, what is it R norm let's say I wanted to draw um, 10 samples from a normal distribution of mean 0 standard deviation 1 right that's gonna give me these 10 values now of note here is that we're drawing integers so we want the mean to be at least one and say I want this to have like a larger standard deviation so I can get some more variability in terms of the number that I'm going to be able to get access to. And then let me just extend this vector out a little bit more. Let me get longer. So now, say I call this sub, because I'm going to sub for this. So now that I generated this little subset of values here, might break but because the index yeah okay once again it needs to be longer or it needs to be two two ish and one is zero is maybe mix we'll make it so two levels okay ah uh, right we can't have zero values let's make the mean two <laughs> and then let's take the absolute value here. <laughs> I really want to get this example to work. <laughs> so say I generated these numbers. I'll take the absolute value of a random generation of 10 normally distributed with mean to standard deviation 2. So you can see here, oh, I'm still, still going to have a 0. <laughs> oh, yeah, no, this is, this is how I can do it. I just add 1. Okay. So now I'm also adding a constant. So now all of my values should abide by the rule. 
Okay, so now I see I generated these 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 digits. I generated these va normally distributed values, but if I were to sub x here, you can see the values I get out are going to correspond to the first the integer and in the front of each of these. So a lot of the cases I'm getting one. So I'll get one, 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 four, two. So to see that then, we should get the same three values for the first three elements of the subset. 2.1, 2.1, 2.1, see? That's kind of cool. So that's the example of how I could imagine that being used, why I would do it this way. Maybe there's some nice property ab about randomly sampling the subsets using this normal distribution. I don't think so. And there are also other functions that can do this very much more elegantly, like sample, for example. Like we can just sample x. And I can get random samples from x. It's a lot easier. And, but this is kind of cool to think about. <laughs> Okay, wait. I can get my laptop charger, it looks like. Um, yeah, I don't know if you guys can see that, but low percent. My computer always gets a little salty at me during stream when I start using R. I should have like a warning. See, I, I can actually... It's weird because I know my computer is glitching. Like my cursor is even glitched. I wonder how I can fix that. Probably because I have another window with R Studio. Maybe I can exit out. Sorry, don't look at my assignments. That might help. Give it a little restart. Also, I'm really glad restart is so quick. If you don't know, on Max it's Shift Command Zero, and I strongly encourage you to restart your sessions all the time. I restart session basically after any time I make a substantial change to whatever I'm working on, just to make sure that there's nothing about what I did that couldn't be generated again. That's the point of doing something programmatically in the first place is that if I stepped away from it on scratch, I should be able to just re-implement it. Not, of course, you should account for computation time and stuff. There might be instances where you want to save some values because it takes a long time to, for it to do this sort of running process in the first place. And in those cases, I'd turn away from rerunning the computation every time, but there are ways you, you can cache the values, cache, like save them. You can also just save the outputs and then load, reload in particular play, spots that take long, etc. But we're not talking about efficient R programming today. And But I will just say, if anyone is interested in the book, Efficient R Programming,
let me know because I'm very interested in going through this material in the same way that I'm doing this introductory to R class. Class. Uh, but I don't have a copy of this book yet, so maybe when I get a new copy, I, I used to have a copy, but I ended up getting rid of it, to say the least on that. But I used to have a copy of this book. I would love to go through some of the the work in this book. It's technical stuff related to our programming that would be really cool. Another book on my list would be our packages. Once again, Hadley Wickham. Seems like a very cool book. Would love to build a package. It's one of my dreams. It'd be so cool to have a package. Um, so, if anybody wants to do that, build packages together, we can do that too. Oh, and Jenny Bryan. And our superstar. Okay. So, let's keep moving then. That was a nice example. Sorry if my, I was trying to give my stream a sec, so maybe I would pick up the speed after I made some changes, but I don't think that's going to be the case. And I'm really not trying to stop stream midstream because of how I share these things on YouTube. But I might have to figure out a new system. But basically, I can export the files in full per stream, so I'm not sure how what would be the API behavior on Twitch's side if I pause stream. Would it generate that this is a new stream? That's a question to ask, not a question to be answered right now. So let's get back into it. So we just talked about subsetting, positive integers, and we just went through an example of real numbers being truncated to integers. So we drew out a sample of normally distributed numbers in order to subset our vector. Cool. Well, something else of note then is that we can also exclude values from particular positions using negative integers. And so to do that, you would just use a negative sign instead of a positive integer. Simple enough. So in our example here, we could just write a negative. Oh, wait, because I reset. We could write a negative. And this is going to... Um, I should say I'm right. So this is going to be... T Ah, oh, right, two left. Because my one, two. Says the length on there. But. <clears throat> oh, it's because I knew the length. <laughs> yeah, eighth. It's so like eighth. So if I tell it to two less, and then I looked at the length of this, this is good. Looked at the length of this, we would expect the length to be two less. Six. See? Because I have it in negative. But if the negative wasn't there, then I'm getting two. So then you should get two. You get two. Negative. Here. Here. You get six. Simple enough, once again. In and out. No one gets hurt. <laughs> into the data structure, out of the data structure, everyone got what they wanted <laughs> or didn't want. You could also use logicals. So in this case, logicals are going to return trues. So and we'll say we wanted the first two, not the last two. Boop. And we would get the first two. Excuse me. What makes this one particularly useful, and you'll end up using it a lot, especially for qualities, 
or at least in my case, I use them a lot for equalities. Uh, so cases where you want like equal, equal, or equal, equal. Is that you can just put in the logicals into the subset. So say I wanted from x all the values where this logical statement is true, where x is greater than 3. And that's going to give me these. Cool. So we can also, what happens if we have an x and then we subset using y, but they're different lengths? So this is controlled by what's called the recycling rule, where the shorter of the two is recycled to the length of the longer. We've seen this before when we were looking at imputing or putting values into data frames such that the constraint that the data fr the columns in the data frame are the same wasn't met and so in order to ensure that the length of all the columns was the same we had the recycling rule was applied where values in the data in the shorter of the columns were recycled to match the length of the longest column in the data frame and this behavior was different as a function if you were using a table, a tibble, or a data frame, where there is more stringent constraints for recycling values using tibbles. And in fact, you can only recycle values using tibbles if it's a single, if it's a sca scalar vector size one. Data frames will like repeat, but they have to have the particular correct amount of elements. So true, false, we'll get this out. True, false, true, false. So right, if I wanted this subset, I'm asking the subset X that has four values, but I only provided two. But what this does then is, okay, it knows that X has four, but y has two, so it's gonna use the shorter of the two, that being the true false, and it's gonna duplicate it, so it's gonna be true false, true false. So it's just showing that these two statements are equivalent because the size, the length of the vector x is four. Missing values always report missing values. You can also, okay, right, so we use, so just a review, positive, negative integers, logical vectors, and we'll move to three more ways to you can subset. You can use nothing. That's always nice. Oh, philosophical. <laughs> Which actually is pretty useful in some cases, uh, particularly because of some of those things I briefly spoke about in the beginning where it asked about the difference between the name assignment of x to a value of 0 and to x with the brackets to a value of um, 0. So there's differences in between that, and part of that is because of this behavior. So when you're using larger, dim dimensionally large, more complex data structures, returning the original size vector, or returning the original vector, is going to be a, use a, a useful behavior. Okay. You can also return a link zero. You don't do this on purpose, but it could help test stuff. Also, even Hadley doesn't see too much use in the zero length one. Because I couldn't think of much many examples either. All right. If a vector is named, as we saw here and what we were trying to demonstrate, explore, you can use character vectors. So we know that this is going to be especially useful when we're talking about subsetting data frames, because data frames are going to have columns which are named, right? So each of the lists in the data frame are going to have a name. 
or just each of the column a column. I don't have to go crazy. Each of the columns in the data frame have a name. So subsetting by name is going to be extremely useful in those cases. And in fact, you'll see that it's so useful that ours built convenience functions to subset by character vectors. Yeah, that's right. Okay, so in this case, all we're showing is that say we made, we set the names of X so that they were the first four letters of the alphabet that we always have access to in our environment. <clears throat> we get A, B, C, D. We set those values to this, and then we can access the elements of the, ve the named vector from using those values. Cool. Like integers you can repeat and they have to be matched exactly or you'll get an NA so you can't do this so that's good behavior good R well, also of note here is that If you're using an S3 object, like a factor, then it's going to use the underlying integer values, not the name of the factor in order to do the subsetting. So what they're showing here is that we would think that if we subsetted Y using this factor B, that we might get outputted the value associated with B, which in this case is 4.2. However, recall that a factor um, that has one level is an integer, is equivalent to an integer that is one. So when we attempt to subset the data from this factor, really we're saying y bracket one bracket. And that's why we get up back the a in the first position. because it's the first in, in the first position. So that's cool. All right, let's move on to subsetting data structures beyond atomic vectors. Just like atomic vectors, you can subset lists, you can use brackets, but things that we're going to talk about later that are actually really cool are that you can you could subset using the single bracket and you're going to get a, a list but you can also subset using the double bracket and the dollar sign and these are going to let you pull out particular elements of the list and we're going to demonstrate this more clearly in the future but just know that these subsetting operators or specifically or more specifically the bracket and double bracket subset operators provide different behavior, uh, subsetting behavior. I feel like I've said subset so much tonight and it's my whole life is so already saturated with subsetting because my research projects are focused on what's called subset choice right now. So this involves choosing in our case you can this involves like choosing multiple things when you have a set of many things available to you i mean technically even choosing one thing is just a subset of one but we don't limit it to that so in our case a sub choosing a subset if i had option a b c available to me it could be choosing one a it could choose b choosing a b you could also just be choosing a, B, C, but that's a subset of length equal to the set of items, which is not that meaningful in a lot of cases. It could be meaningful, but not interesting to me right now. That's enough of those little tangents, <laughs> or that tangent on that, at least. Um, so moving into data structures that have more dimensions, we can subset 
higher dimensional data structures using either s single elements, multiple elements, or, or entire vectors to, for example, like, I guess this will, we'll just, we'll give an example right now, but here we'll create a matrix that's going to have three rows. And we'll make it so that it's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. And we'll name each of the columns in this matrix A, B, C. And we're going to bind this matrix to the name A. Now, if we wanted to look at the first two rows, so here, notice that we're using this comma now. If we wanted the subset A, and we wanted the first two rows of A, and all of the columns, since we don't indicate anything in the second after the comma, keeping it blank, all rows and all columns, we'll get this out. Naturally, you could also make it more tricky and use different sorts of subsetting on each of these. So say I wanted the first row and the third row, and I also only wanted the columns B and A, well, here you go. And also say I wanted no rows and I didn't want the second column, so I get AC. Very cool. A note of here is that we use the positive and negative integers, but we're able to do this in this case because this is like doing two subsets at the same time, conveniently. In one case, we're just subsetting the rows, subsetting the columns. We couldn't do this intermixing of positive and negative integers in our subsetting, or we couldn't do this, for, for that matter, um, if these weren't independent s subsetting behaviors occurring simultaneously. OK, let's keep it going. Subsetting on the basis of a single bracket is always going to give us the simplest data struct uh, dimensionality structure possible. So this is what's known as dropping. And we talked about dropping here, but recall that A is a matrix. But if I only called, if I only subsetted that I wanted the first row, then <clears throat> What actually happens here is that the dimensions of the output have reduced to a one-dimensional vector. And in this case, same thing here. I wanted the, this column, I wanted a one, but I still decreased in the amount of dimensions of my original data structure. And we can make this a lot more clear by doing this, by looking at the attributes. just in case you don't have an intuition about how this is going to outlay, but it's going to go lower. So it'll oh, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, sort of how I was visually describing or describing with my mouse before. And in this case, these aren't named, but now we have a named matrix. And we can actually look at that by looking at the attributes. So here we have dimensions. We have dimension name, none. But for the second dimension, this would be rows, row names, column names, dimension two. But it's a matrix, so it's not calling it row names. It's just calling it the second dimension. So the second dimension is named ABC. And now, let's take a look at some of the dropping behavior. So I can. More distinctly, I can just call dim on A, and this will give me the dims. But say I made A, A naught, 
and assigned it here. As we could guess, we're going to lose dimensionality. No. In fact, if I look at the attributes here, it's just a vector, a mean vector. And we can do something similar with our A1 example. I really should have picked a better naming protocol. You can see we're going to know. Whenever we look at the attributes, we get A. So from both these cases, you can see that we retain the names of the columns but we don't retain the dimensionality of the original um, matrix. It took it away from us. And you don't always want it to take it away from you. And so why we're talking about this, maybe I can just do this. Drop equals plus. I think this helps, right? So now in this case, with drop equals false instead, if I were to take a look at the attributes now of the name that I bound the subset to, it's going to retain the dimensionality. So now I have one row because it, that's what I wanted, right? I wanted one, one row. And I still have the same amount of dimension as before. Now, the contents of the dimensions is different. Of note here, right? I used to have three rows and I had three columns, and now I have one row and three and three columns. But I still have two dimensions. Here's, um, so, right, looking at up here, three, three. Wow, well, what we'll call none. <clears throat> cool stuff. This is just telling us that we can access values in a matrix using single values. So in this case, say I was interested in the fourth and the fifteenth one. Well, I know one, two, three, four. Fourth is going to be here. And then the fifteenth one, if these is five, so we have five, ten, fifteen. Here's the fifteenth one. So you can still use a single vector because. Under the hood, this is still just a vector in to R. The matrix attributes lets you manipulate it in particular ways. Meta um, because of the metadata, but it's still just a really long series of numbers stored, organized using characteristics set by the attributes, but not saved in that structure itself. It's a sh sh saved as a long list of numbers. I think that's a good way to put it. You can also subset into higher dimensions. So here, say I wanted to select. Say I wanted to create a matrix that I could grab out values from this with. So I don't always have to use vectors, is basically what this wants to tell me. You could use matrices of values to extract information from higher um, complex data structures, higher dimensional data structures. So basically what this is saying is, okay, give me two columns of these values. And then three, one, two, four. And you have to put by row here so that it organizes at one, one, three, one, two, four, instead of going this way. And then I just want to select values from, I want to subset values using select. So I'm using a higher dimensional data structure of integers in this case, in order to subset my higher dimensional or my high dimensional data structure, my matrix, 
and I'll get out two one three one two four. So as we see, like so. And it's just going in there and it's picking doot 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 doot. It's like putting in these three things. Okay. This might be the last thing, right? Let's see, data frames, tools, dimensionality. Yeah, we'll get to that. We'll go. We'll do two more sections. Okay. So now we're trying to talk about subsetting from data frames, data frame and tables. So data frames let you do things that you could do both with lists and matrices. So basically, the, all, all the things that we talked about before with lists and matrices and atomic factors for that matter, all these things are going to apply to data frames and tibbles. So when you're subsetting a data frame, if you were just to subset a data frame using a singular index, a singular index, and you're going to get behavior that's like a list. But if you wanted to get behavior that was like the matrix case, so like some of the more complex, higher dimensional structures that we talked about just moments ago, you could use two indices. And you would just want to indicate that using the column. So of note here is that if I use data frame 1, 2, that behaves differently than data frame 1, 2, column. Com. This will give me the first two columns because this is treating it column wise and now I'm got, I've got access to the rows in this case so if this was one into two it would give me the first two rows and of course all the columns because I'm not specif I'm, I'm specifying an empty spot for the the columns and so let's see some of that behavior in action so here we just assign the name to the value that to the data structures, which is a data frame where we have three columns. One that is um, numbers from one to three, here we have three to one, and then we have A, B, C. And so I can use a logical here to subset the data frame. So here I'm saying that I want to look at the data frame column X, and I want to get out the values that are equal to two and I'm looking at the rows and then give me all the columns so here in this case we know that there's only one value of 2 in x so it's going to spit out that row and it's going to retain all the columns because I didn't specify anything here moving along to another example here say I just wanted the first row and the third row and I want all the columns. So well, here you go. I can get the first and third row. There are two ways to select columns from a data frame. You can do it like a list, and you can do it like a matrix. Boop. To so say I wanted columns. So these are both grabbing rows. But let me grab some columns. Here, since the columns are named, I can just create this concatenated vector of characters. And I can get out X and Z. And notice that I'm not using the com the comma there because I want to I want to grab columns. Or in the same way, I could include the column, but I have to make sure it's on the right hand side of the column because that's subsetting for the columns, second dimension. And if I wanted some particular set of rows from this, I would have to put it on the left side of the column, the comma. So this is something important to note, and it has to do with this behavior of dropping attributes. If I looked at the structure when I subsetted my data frame and I wanted only the X column, you can see here that I'm going to get out 
three observations of variable one, int. But I'm not simplifying the structure. In this case, I am simplifying the structure. And part of that is because I'm using the matrice subsetting. So I was doing what's over here. So I would need to include something like drop for this behavior to not occur when I'm doing indexing with matrix data. Right, so the difference you want to see here is that I get back a data frame here and I don't get it back a data frame here. So I'm coercing the characteristics of the output. And that might be maladaptive behavior depending on your application. Like say you want, you need the data frame back because later in the pipeline, it's, it's gonna do something that manipulates the data frame. And this is called, this is a bug. So something to think about. And has been thought about such that tibbles, once again, with all their tippleness or all their conservativeness, you could say, is that tibbles will always return the same data structure. So if you did this column wise or matrix wise subsetting, you'll get back the same structure from either. Okay, and now we'll move into the last section that we're going to go through tonight, and we're talking about preserving dimensionality. So this has sort of been like the overdrop to a lot of the conversations that we've had through each of these sections. We've been bringing up, oh, but watch out for this, watch out for this, watch out for this. Well, this is what's happening. It's the drop command. So in order to make sure that you preserve the original dimensionality of the data structure that you're subsetting, you need to include this additional argument in the subset, drop equals false. So remember, if I had a matrix here, one, two, three, four, and I looked at the structure of subsetting it, I dropped a dimension. But if I keep drop false here, now I have the same number, I have two dimensions still. While the, the content of the dimension is different, I. <clears throat> I still have two dimensions and that might be important especially if we're doing with matrices right and so you're doing some manipulation on the matrix and you want to get out a piece of it but you need it to have the same amount of the same amount of dimensions because you want to put something in those spots later I don't know I'm just trying to think of examples off the top of my head Right, and we see this here with data frames, occurring with data frames too. So if I made a data frame A, B, one, two, so well, this is A and B, and they both have one and two, right? And I wanted the column A, well, it's gonna just spit out the vector one, two, because we know that's what A is equal to. But it's not a data frame anymore. So I might wanna keep it as a data frame when I do this sort of subset procedure and in this case, that seems particularly really important. I imagine if I had some clean data and I wanted to just pull out some, I might want it to stay a data frame so I can use it. I could bring it back and combine it with another structure or something. Yeah, so just something to look out for. So default true is the behavior common source of bugs and functions. So you check your code, a data frame, the matrix, and it works. Six months later, someone else may want to do something where they use it to do some subsetting behavior and you get this error. So when you're writing functions, so this is important for writing functions, Include the drop. Tibbles are always drop false. 
another great thing about Tibbles. So Tibbles always giving back Tibbles, and they're not they're not dropping dimensions. Factor subsetting also has drop falls, but its meaning's a little different. Let's see. So this is actually useful, and uh, this is a behavior I find so annoying, and it actually brings to light a lot of things that come up. So okay, what it's saying in this example, and I'll I'll pump I'll pump into this one. What's it saying in this example? Is say I had a, a factor z here, an attribute. And we know z has two levels, a and b. And it's a factor which remind you are integers under, under the hood. Um, and I wanted just the first one. So I want to subset Z. And I, let me call this Z new. So say Z new. And let me take a look at the attributes now of Z new. We can see that we've retained everything that we had in the first case. So we still have two levels, we still have a class factor. Now, if we were to look at, that's kind of makes sense in this case where I know that this particular structure has multiple levels, so. Concrete, and my fe male and female, right? And say Z new, I took just the first one, so I'm gonna get male. And I look at the attributes. I still want to know that there's two levels to this factor, even though that the content of it is just male. There's only two levels. Well, if I set drop to true instead, then you can take a guess about what I get back here in this case. Well, I'm, I'm going to get back just males. So I dropped all the levels that weren't included in the new subset. So it, I'm going to basically refactorize the, the variable. This is very useful, this drop. And specifically in psychology, when people are analyzing, or I guess one example that comes to mind, or a particular use case, is when you're analyzing survey data, Sometimes you might, and maybe this is just bad behavior and part of doing the pre-processing, but you might download the CSV, upload it in the R, make sure strings weren't coerced to factors, but say they were coerced to factors. Now when I'm subsetting out, excuse me, I might have factors that are tagging along to the data structures that there were no observations for. For example, you know, say there is a particular racial or ethnical background group in demographic questionnaire that didn't have any representation in this sample, but you factorized early. And so the level is still within your factor structure. This is now gonna have weird performance things later on when I'm summarizing the data I'm just gonna have this zero column like there were none of that or if I was running a regression and I had no observations for something you get the point if I was creating a table etc I'm not saying not to report those things I'm just saying that the behavior of the factor in the context of the analysis you don't want it to have those levels or you might want it to have those levels but there are cases you don't want it to have those levels and i've sort of just explaining my, my this through myself right now because this is something that i felt like i did all the time where i would i would subset and then i'd re, i'd write factor again like i'd write another line 
square, I would do this. look at the attributes here but then I write factor again so that if I looked at the attributes it's one level because it looks at what's inside so I'm doing like double work I'm, I have additional lines of code when I could have just included something like drop and got the same behavior so that might be of use to some people and might not be clear at least it wasn't clear for me when I started learning the language I always thought I had to do this double factor when I subsetted to if I can get rid of those levels, but you can include it to just get rid of the levels. Very cool. Okay, let's go through some of the exercises and then we'll shut it down for the day. <clears throat> Fix each of the following. Let's do it. Okay, what do we got? Unexpected equals. Well, that's because we're trying to do a logical here, and then the quality in R is not 4. It's 2. Ding. Also, empty cars. If you're not familiar, empty cars is a very popular data set, data set that's used primarily for instructional purposes to demonstrate statistical or to, de to demonstrate the behaviors of functions or visualizations. And it has a lot of nice properties that you'd want. So it has character vector, or it has some numeric character. It's like a variety of useful variables. Or it has a set of useful variables that you can use to demonstrate <coughs> functions. And that's it. And it's stored in bit R, so you, you can just access it. Okay, in this case, I'll run it again. Oh, why can't you do this? Well, that's because 1 to 4, in this case, needs to be. Right. So we had a negative, but we were giving like positive values, so we were intermixing the two. We want to do this. We can do this too. In the first case, I'm getting the first four rows. In the second case, I'm saying I don't want the first four rows. Okay. <clears throat> um, we're trying to access columns. So we want these rows, <clears throat> specifically we want rows where cycle is less than 5, so notice here cycle is all 4s, but we needed to include this comma so that we were accessing the data frame using the particular type, the, the correct, we were accessing the rows in the data frame. Okay, and then this one, this one works. Um, but. It's not doing what we think it's doing. So the issue with this one is that we're trying to use two logicals, but to use two logicals, you have to write it all out. So something like this. So now I got six and fours. And we can tell this wasn't working before because I said I wanted six and fours. We could also just look at the links. Um, well, the links will be the same. The end rows. 
because we're dealing with data frames, it would have the same number of columns. Um, what is the function type? N row. N row, not n rows. 32. In this case, we would expect it to give us a smaller one, right? Because if we have additional constraints, 18. So nothing happened here. Something happened here. Cool. That was fun. Next, why does the following code yield five missing values? I almost thought it was like a true or false thing, and it was looking at each of them, and it was making them all. Sort of applying an NA to them all. Any numerical computation involving NA returns an NA. <laughs> I'm not really sure. But I'm going to check out the solutions on that. We'll come back to it, see if something inspires me. What's upper try return? Oh, 